Hey everybody, it's Chris Kerr, and thanks so much for joining me for this little video. I want to take a moment to talk about an experience I had a few weeks ago. It's kind of been playing in my head for a while. And I saw something, and it just said, it was a t-shirt, and it said, expect. Didn't do anything to me at the moment, but then I scrolled down and saw another um, t-shirt actually and it said change your expectations and something about the two of those just triggered a thought in me that the expectations are the problem when we worry when we fret when we get upset about something when we squabble with our spouse or with our kids or with even our, our pets uh, with colleagues at work when we are in a job where things are rough and it's not working the way we want it to and it, it's just it's hard every day it, it's hard you, you go to work you kind of put your big boy or girl pants on and you put your work boots on you go to work and you do what you got to do but that's not it's not fulfilling puts food on the table and that's important but it's harder. It's a lot harder than it needs to be. And I, I drilled down a whole lot, looking at exactly what it is that the problem is. Is it the other person's actions? They're responsible for their own actions, and yeah, a lot of the time they're, they're pretty crappy actions. Pretty lousy choices that people are making just because of ego or will or incompetence, stupidity. Take your pick. You see it in business and organizations and government every day. Somebody does something stupid and somebody else pays a price for it. Oftentimes a lot of people pay a price for it. But I think it was Jim Rohn who made that point that 90% of our, our problems, the problem itself isn't the problem. It's our response to it. And so if we can change our response to it, how those problems manifest going forward change dramatically. So as I reinterpret that in terms of this concept of the expectations then, it's not the problem that's the problem, it's how we react to it that's the problem, then I don't think it's even the problem that's the problem. It's our expectations of the problem that are the problem. Now think about this for a minute. Tail end of 2012, 2013, I did that study. I've told you guys about this before, but I'm going to repeat it for those who don't know. I did a, I did a study of, um, I did a survey, basically, of the experts in my network through groups and whatnot on LinkedIn and, and other social networks. And these experts I broke up into three groups of 450 experts each. The first group were on personal goals, achieving personal goals. The second group were on uh, successful projects and the third group were all on business goals business uh, success and so I asked all of them a number of questions but one of the, the main ones I asked was this what is the number one cause of failure these are people who get paid a lot of money to turn organizations or individual performance or projects around so they know what's failing in order to fix it. That, that's what they do. So I expected to see for personal goals, you're going to get one set of things. For projects, which behave very differently, you're going to find a different set of things. And for businesses or organizations, you're going to find a totally different set of issues. And I was utterly stunned to discover that with a 2.1% margin of difference, all three groups reported exactly the same causes of failure. Pardon me, my nose is really itchy today. Um, anyhow, the three causes of failure went in this order. 70% of all causes of failure came from some kind of fear. Fear of success, fear of failure, fear of judgment, fear of lack of support. You know, pick your fear, any fear. They all get lumped into that one thing. Something scares people away from being able to fully commit and fully do what they need to do to get things done. The next group of causes of failure is composed of either not having sufficient motivation to do it 
or that there's no driving need, right? That leaves 10% for all other causes of failure combined. 10%. All other causes of failure combined. I want you to think about that for a minute. That includes not enough resources, not enough time, not enough expertise, not enough skill, not enough experience. Everything else, the wrong place, the wrong time, timing was bad, market was bad, tragedy happened, earthquake, volcanoes, everything else. All other causes of failure combined make up the last 10%. That means 90%, plus or minus 2.1%, which was the difference between each group, 90% of the cause of failure, 1,350 experts have told me, comes from between our ears, right? It's either fear or lack of motivation or need. Those are all headspace issues. Come back to the problem's not the problem, how you react to the problem's the problem. Come back further to that point about our expectations and now synthesize these three into a, a new thought. And the new thought works like this. Worry comes directly from your expectation of what could go wrong, right? That, that's, that's, a, that's what worry is. The problem hasn't even happened yet, and it's already a problem, right? Problem hasn't happened yet, and it's already a problem. Now, what if we don't expect? No expectations. We prepare for everything, but there's no expectations. None. Not good expectations, not bad expectations. We replace expectations with genuine curiosity. How's this going to work? I'm curious to know if this works. I'm curious to know if it doesn't work. What if it doesn't work? We'll try again. Change the parameters a little bit. But try again until we find a way that does work. But we do it through curiosity, not through expectations. What happens if the income doesn't come in in time to pay that particular bill? Well, I can worry about it, or I can be curious about it and go find out the answer. And when I find that answer, I can then ask the following question. So if that the worst case scenario happens and I can predict that it's possible that it happens now, before it happens, what could I do to prevent, fix, or come up with an alternative solution to it? For example, you don't pay your internet bill and you're three days away from it being cut off. Maybe you don't have the money yet, it's coming in five days from now, not three days, and you can't get a loan. Let's just say that's it. With everybody in America having less than $500 total between paychecks, that's, that's a, something that has to happen to a lot of families on a nearly daily basis all across the country for every service imaginable, whether it's power, water, garbage disposal, your internet, your cable TV, doesn't matter what it is. Families are going through that specific problem day in, day out, week after week. So maybe you don't have enough for that particular internet bill today. And you need it three days from now or sooner. And you're not getting it till five days from now. Well, if you have a little money, maybe you can find an alternative internet supplier that can patch you over for that time period. Maybe you can make a payment arrangement. Maybe you can... Um, trade a payment for one thing in order to free up money to pay this one instead. Maybe you can um, trade, make a payment arrangement with a buddy. They pay your bill, you pay their bill. Maybe you can um, find a tool or a product that you can leverage to, to sell something that gets you through or enough to get a replacement in the interim.
you may in fact find that the replacements are a lot cheaper than the bill you're already paying and better quality. You may actually save yourself a whole lot of money if you only look. And this bill situation might just be that opportunity to go look for something better, something smarter. Yeah, it wasn't on your to-do list, but if you're going to lose it anyway, you might as well try. What's what's bad about that? Nothing. It's, it's a pain, but so much change in life is a pain. Think about the lobster, right? We think of lobsters as being the size we see at the table, but do you think they started that way? No. They started as tiny little things, and they grew, and they grew and grew and grew until they became the lobster that lands on your table. But each time they grow, they can only grow as big as their shell. The shell doesn't grow with them. That means they have to break out of their own exoskeleton. That sounds joyful, right? That sounds like a lot of fun. That won't hurt at all, right? they got to break out of their own exoskeleton and sit absolutely prone while their enemies are hunting for them until they grow a new one. That doesn't sound painful at all to anyone who's had growing pains in their bones, right? Growth most often comes from pain. But if you stop looking at it as pain and start looking at it as an opportunity, as a way forward, as a way to get an advantage, to evolve an advantage, it's no longer pain, it's an evolution. Think about it seriously as an evolution. If you follow me at all, you know I've got immense back pain. I've torn pretty much every ligament and tendon in my back several times. Um, that's just different accidents. It is what it is. So I'm intimately familiar with pain. Don't don't think I'm saying this just out of my butt. You know, this is I, I friend, pain and I are long, long, long-term friends. We've known each other for a very long time. I'm not saying that for the oohs and ahs and whatnots. I'm saying that because I, I get it. I understand the pain equation. There are days where I can't do what I need to do. I can't do what I want to do. I get it. But I still, for the most part, have a pretty positive attitude. And I think a lot of it's because I still have this curiosity about life. I have this curiosity about what's around the next corner, what's around the next bend, what's the next chance for treatment, what's the next deadline for, for uh, generating revenue to be able to go pay for that treatment, what, what's it take to do this, what's it take to do that. I'm always curious. I don't really have an expectation that I'm going to get healed today or next week or six months from now. I, I don't have an expectation. I just know that sooner or later it will happen. There are lots of therapies and techniques and technologies I can use that will eventually get me to heal most, if not all, of those ligaments and tendons. My pain levels will drop from the ceiling to very, very manageable and tolerable levels. Obviously, I'm looking forward to that. In the meantime, I still have a life to lead. Now, I can stop and bemoan the fact that it hurts. I can say, oh, I need more meds, I need more this, I need, I need, I need, I need, I need. Why do I need them? Because I have an expectation that if I fulfill those needs, the pain will go away. That's the same argument that an addict makes. I need to eat. I need to drink. I need drugs. I need, I need, I need. Why? Why do you need? Wouldn't it be interesting if you could live your life in a way where you don't have any of those needs? What you really need is a roof over your head, food on the table, clothes on your back, the ability to do what you need to do in life. 
preferably a bathroom with toilet paper and a way to wash up, right? That these are needs. A place to rest that's safe. Comfort, love, support. These are all needs. Maslow's hierarchy. Those are all needs. Expectations aren't needs. And I think if we flip it on its ear and we swap out expectations for I'm genuinely curious. I really want to know. It's a totally different worldview. It's a totally different way of life. It's a totally different thought process. And it doesn't come easy. Because I'm working on this myself. Again, I only came up with the idea a few weeks ago. Based on the mental dots I connected that I went through earlier. What if we seriously stopped expecting? Stop expecting your spouse to do whatever. Don't expect it. Well, if you don't expect it, and they do something that, yeah, they may do all the time, but you're not expecting it, guess what happens? Now you're grateful again. Thank you, honey. I, I appreciated that. You can sit here and expect your spouse will do whatever. And your spouse can sit there and expect that you're going to do whatever. But the reality is you're still in a relationship. The relationship needs constant work and evolution or it grows stale. And if it grows stale, then it can go downhill from there. Because if anyone's seen a stack of stale bananas, you know things can get a lot worse shortly thereafter, right? And we already have too high a divorce rate, most of it for money reasons, which is no reason at all. Right? That those are solvable things. Now I'm not crapping on anybody who's gotten divorced over or money issues. That's not the point. The point is, if we stopped the expectations, if we genuinely got curious about our relationships, if we genuinely were appreciative of the things we didn't expect to actually get done, getting done, and we reciprocated with each other on that basis, imagine how much happier our daily lives would be. How much kinder our daily lives would be. How much more fulfilling and satisfying our daily lives would be. Unexpect. I want you to seriously think about how different your life would be if instead of expecting, you unexpected things. You stopped expecting things. You caught yourself, whenever you expected something, you stop and you say, is that what I think should happen? Or is that what only happens when that's what somebody else wants to do? When it's their priority, I appreciate that. If it's not their priority, I wonder what their priority was. Not to be mad about it, but I'm actually curious. What, what took up that time? You see, families, and, and the historical one, historical model was the, the male-female roles, right? The, the wife was supposed to be at home and, and clean and tidy and, and look after kids and all, all those traditional roles, right? And the husband was supposed to go out and work his butt off all day and bring home a paycheck. Obviously, those are very traditional. It doesn't work that way so much anymore. Most are two-income houses. That There are a whole lot of different things that have changed. But let's just use the old model as an example to make the point. Historically, you saw many cases where the husband was under the impression the wife really didn't do a whole lot all day. And likewise, the wife thought, well, all you do is go to your office every day. You sit behind a desk. That's all you do. You should be in great shape to come home and take care of all these extra things at the end of the day. Between the two of them, neither one has the faintest frickin' clue what the other's day has been like at all. And so they're making these vicarious comparisons based on absolutely no understanding of how the other's day or, or priorities have gone and what they've invested themselves in in their time. 
they come home or, or they the spouse comes home and now they're primed for a fight because they have expectations of the other that have no chance of being valid but there, there's no chance you have to start with a curiosity how was your day ah well neighbor so-and-so mom so-and-so dad so-and-so kids did this animals did that this did that blah 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 at the office oh my god my boss is doing this they're talking to that person i've already said please don't do that without that communication you have no idea the joys and blisses that the other person's gone through right you also miss out on the good things that they accomplish the great things that happened with them for them and by them these things are things that can only come out to you when you're genuinely curious when you have no expectations please join me in this this what i'm going to try to make happen as a as a full-on movement because i think it it can change society to having a much better happier healthier life if you simply unexpect and it's not easy i expect my kid to do things and some days she doesn't some days she does i have to, <clears throat> i have to stop that as a parent set standards but unexpect take away my expectations of her ability to reach those standards take away my expectations of what quality she's going to achieve in doing those things and i found that on those occasions where i do that she and i get to have a much better conversation i get to understand why she does what she does a little better and more importantly she reciprocates she feels better about how she and i work on, on our relationship doesn't make it easy i'm not pretending in the slightest that this is easy but if you commit to it i promise you you're going to find some really positive rock star results that come out of it unexpect and your life will change i'm chris care Thanks for listening. Have a great day.